There is a general purpose we have in mind when we're assigned readings for school, and that is to isolate the bits of the text in order to best convey whatever it is that the teacher wants us to understand. And that is a very particular way of reading. It's reading as a student. And what I have grown to appreciate so much is after school is done, to go back to some of those textbooks, to some of those anthologies, and to just stay with them for a time instead of reading them for the purpose of taking specific notes to write an essay or to be able to speak on a subject with a certain kind of erudite quality. Instead, the goal is merely to just sit in the translations, to take in that sentiment from many, many years past, and to see the similarity between ourselves and those who came long before us. And I got to thinking about these differences in purpose, the difference in purpose between being a student and being someone outside of school. And I got to thinking about that because I wanted to do a bookshelf tour, right? I have so many books behind me on all of the shelves of my house. I have about seven bookshelves. Each of the bookshelves is double stacked. So it's really equivalent to 14 bookshelves. It's a ton of books. And I wanted to just begin a bookshelf tour. And I noticed that the very first shelf had a kind of theme to it. And that is a series of Norton anthologies. And as I was browsing through these, it got me thinking, why not just make a video as the first bookshelf tour video, just appreciating these anthologies, because I think there is something special about them. And it's a kind of specialness that maybe we would miss when we're younger and just being assigned scattered readings throughout the book. And that is a general arc of history alongside an arc of literature. And so I want to talk about each of these anthologies. This is kind of just, just like uh, some of my other videos. It's really just a way to recommend something to just to get you to want to read some books that you otherwise would have ignored. In this case, these books contain various books and various poems and various epics and various long treatises on different kinds of ideas and things. So um, the first in this collection is going to be probably my favorite of the Norton anthologies. And that is the Norton Anthology of World Literature. So you can see the edition I have here. This is the second edition of Norton Anthology of World Literature. And the edition you get does matter in a lot of ways because the standards of what should be in an anthology shifts depending on who the editors are, who's being consulted in each academic field. And um, in some ways we move away from the notion of canonical texts. What ends up happening is instead of having just the texts that are most referenced or most influential, it becomes more of a spattering of the influential texts alongside perhaps unheard of authors who happen to be living in the time who were still writing and trying to create something extraordinary out of their pen or out of their pencil, whatever it is that they're using. The Norton Anthology of World Literature stands out to me because it felt to me like a way of making my way through world history. But instead of just reading the history of ourselves based on what we tell ourselves about ourselves, the way that history becomes like memory, it's a series of relationships that we're making out of otherwise scattered data. And we're linking those relationships together of those images of time and then we're making it into a story for ourselves. This is a collection of the stories we vie to tell others. The ways that when we're writing an epic poem or we're writing some kind of story, we're thinking about the sentiments that other people care about. We're thinking about other people's desires and what they most strive for in their aspirations and how to tell a fulfilling declaration of that striving. And then in the process, it's revealing a lot about what matters to us. And so I love being able to read a chronological view of world history where it's going chronologically through our stories because our stories can be so revealing in a different kind of way than just merely the collection of what politicians were doing or what wars were happening or what cultures were migrating in various directions. It's a different kind of history. So I want to recommend that you check out the Norton Anthology of World Literature. The one that I have has one, two, three, four, five, six volumes total. 
I'll try to hold this up for you. So here we go. We got six volumes of the Norton Anthology of World Literature. It's falling right here. And again, um, what I appreciate so much about going back to these anthologies, specifically the World Literature one, is as I'm learning about world history, it's giving me a chance to also glimpse into the desires of the day, right? The stories that mattered to people at the time. And in these Norton anthologies, um, we're getting complete works of really, really great pieces. You know, there's so many books that you could buy that will contain these broad epics like Homer's Iliad or Odyssey or the Aeneid by Virgil. But in these books, you get a collection of, from around the world, a lot of the major works that seemingly matter, the works that stick around. For instance, you get a complete copy of the Epic of Gilgamesh. You get a complete copy of Homer's Odyssey. You get a complete copy of uh, Sophocles' Antigone and Oedipus the King. You get complete copies of Beckett's Endgame and uh, Faulkner's The Bear and Joyce's The Dead and Thomas Mann's Death in Venice, the complete narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. You get to read Melville's Billy Budd Sailor. You get to read Tolstoy's The Death of Ivan Ilyich. So it's just back to back. These works just contained in a broad collection. And the really nice thing about these anthologies is because, because these anthologies are intended for students, and being young, you know, you just take it in for the classes and you don't think about it too much. It just seems like busy work to see them in the anthology. A lot of these students end up selling it, right? And then they don't get a high price on the market, right? They're viewed as purely textbooks. So people don't really generally care about textbooks outside of school. So once these are done, they then sell for a pretty cheap price. I got each of these volumes, it was like $3 or $5 in some cases. So this one was just $3. You can see the price right there. And so it doesn't add up to that much to get a large amount of really great um, writing and historically relevant writing, writing that influenced and spread throughout different parts of the world. So I really love having these editions and this series, but I also love, I'll grab another series of anthologies. I also have the Norton Anthology of American Literature. And what's really nice about the American Literature one is it doesn't just include the official United States, 1776 onward. It includes the text prior. So you have the various um, journals or letters of conquistadors. You have the colonists and what they were writing about themselves or their vision of the future and the conundrums of their religious belief, for instance. You have the stories and myths of the Native Americans who were there prior to the landing of the various colonists. You have the writings of former slaves and their poetry and their memoirs of themselves. You're getting a broad mix of different kinds of literature. And again, it's that historical overview element that I really like. I get to read history through the voices of the various members in that history. And of course, it's not the only history I should read, but it is nice to just get raw feeling as opposed to raw facts throughout. This one is five volumes. This is the sixth edition that I have. And again, just like the world literature one, it contains a ton of complete works that you just get inside of the anthology so in the case of this one I'm holding, we have The Complete uh, Death of a Salesman by Arthur Miller. We have Allen Ginsberg's long poem, Hal. We get A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams. We get uh, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland poem. We get William Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, Hart Crane's The Bridge poem, which is a really elaborate poem. Uh, we get Mark Twain's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. We get Kate Chopin's The Awakening. So we get all sorts of bigger pieces and snippets, selections from all sorts of other profound, large Gale pieces. And this is just a way of getting American history through American literature.
I also happen to have one volume of the Norton Anthology of English Literature, but this volume is equivalent to about three volumes. So you see it's especially thick. It's like 3,000 pages. And this is the ninth edition of Norton Anthology of English Literature. And, you know, with, with the editions, you do have to worry about what's being cut, what's being added. Is it to your interests what's being added? It's not always going to be canonical. But... Um, in this case, with the English literature, obviously, you're going to get a lot more of the pieces that influence the Western way of thinking, the Western mind. And the poets that are going to be most well-known are probably going to be here in the English literature collection. I don't have the second volume of it. This is split just in two volumes, um, but I'll probably get it at some point. It's just, again, these are resources that are really nice to have, and um, I just want to advertise them to you. You know, you're probably not thinking about Norton anthologies anymore. One of the best things about all of the Norton anthologies is they include copious footnotes explaining the references that authors are making, giving a little bit of the history and context surrounding those different pieces of writing. You get long introductions in some cases. Some of the introductions are mere analysis of the text. Other introductions are giving some of the historical context surrounding the text. Um, you get some essays about different texts contained in these anthologies. It's including a whole range of critical apparatus around the actual writing itself. And that is also really great because it feels like you're being eased in to the significance of what you're reading. It's not just you diving into the deep end and not sure what it is that you're supposed to be understanding. It's a lot of these texts are going to be very distant from our own lives. And so it's nice that with this Norton anthology series, you not only get just back to back pivotal texts, texts that really matter in world history and in the history of various countries such as America or England, but you also get uh, the critical insights of those who have been studying these works for many years of their lives. And that just adds even more understanding and it allows you to just be your own autodidactic student long after your school days are over. So I just finished showing the Norton anthologies that are focused on world literature, American literature, and English literature. But there's also more generally themed topics. So one really great collection is the Norton anthology of modern and contemporary poetry. So here you can see the spines and then here's the front of one of them. And this is split into two volumes. I believe that what I have is the third edition, just like you'd expect it to cover. It's beginning with modern poetry. And as soon as modernism begins, so too does a lot of experimentation and challenge with poetry. Modernism was in the midst of all sorts of changes in history, the industrialization of the world and World War I and World War II. And you had these back-to-back -back great shifts in mind of what society is and what matters in society. And Amidst all those shifts is also a contending with what has to be the case in literature, in poetry. There are so many rules of poetry that began to be disrupted by the modernist poets. And in that way, it makes each author within modernism their own rule set, their own kind of system to think through. It makes it very difficult. A lot of these authors are very obscure. They're constantly referential. It moves away from the lyrical beauty and brilliance of some older poetry, but it also is significant in its constant experimentation. And you get to read these poems and just feel your way through, okay, how are poets now trying to move away from the oral sound-based qualities of prior poetry and trying to just be about reference in itself, about the text in itself and what that means. And it's definitely not for everyone. You know what my experience in going through the modern and contemporary poetry volumes has been one of uh, sometimes frustration because it, you can have these poets who are just absolutely amazing with their metaphors and just the lilt of the song of their poetry. But then you also have these poets who um, bask in obscurity to the point of absurdity where they're not really trying to communicate with you anymore. It becomes really trying to stack references to the point of proving their worth by mere fact. 
as opposed to proving their worth by the value of their verse. And there are still some great poets that you can find here. The modern poetry one begins with a pre-modern poet, Walt Whitman. So you get to just enjoy how smooth his lines flow from one to the next, this constant feeling of momentum going. And then you get to dive into some of the more challenging poets, but they give great introductions prior to each of the poems. And those are a nice way in to understand, okay, why is this poet being included here? If you're reading it and it feels a little confusing, a little mundane, not quite as um, lyrical as you maybe would hope, the introductions give some of the context surrounding these poets, what they were aiming for, what their political acclamations were pushing them toward, what they were, what they were trying to achieve, and whether they achieve it or not is up to you, but you at least get to understand some of why people would find them significant. And so uh, I really think that there's a lot of value in this collection, the Norton Anthology of Modern and Contemporary Poetry. But then there's also the postmodern American poetry. And postmodernism is particularly strange. It goes out of its way to be heavily ironic and it can come across very distant. Um, but there's something about postmodern writing. It's that level of avant-garde experimentation that sometimes when you're lucky, can lead to a far more revealing insight into the mind of the writer. It can feel so much more like they're taking their subconscious and really pushing it out in front of you. And it can feel like you're sharing in thought in a far more direct way than otherwise would be in speech. Speech can be so filtered in terms of our thoughts because you're getting these authors who aren't afraid to be weird, aren't afraid to be really brazen and uncomfortable there can be something blissful in just embracing that honesty and allowing the almost viciousness of commitment that these authors have to their own voice to wash over you and make you feel like you're connecting with someone long ago. The postmodern poetry is the type that, for me, holds up a lot stronger than some of the earlier pieces because it just feels like um, they were vying so hard to be new that in the end, they ended up discovering ways of writing that still feel exciting to me now. And it almost makes some of the poetry and some of the literature that comes out nowadays feel so conservative and tame in comparison. And so it's nice to have a collection like this. There's, um, if you're seeking more experimental texts, this is a great starting point in terms of poetry. Postmodernism in literature is not just poetry. It's also fiction. So there's the Norton Anthology of Postmodern American Fiction. And just like what they were doing with poetry, the postmodernists were trying to experiment as much as possible with uh, what can literature be? Does literature have to be boxed away from the rest of popular society? Or can it reference and embrace the various figures we all know of, the ways in which our lives are so interconnected by media can the postmodern literature somehow integrate the disruptive qualities of advertisements in television and song in radio and bring it into a space where the text itself is singing out to you all of the constant interruptions that the media is singing out to you too. And it's this odd conjunction that postmodern writing brings that allows it to really feel abrasive in a way that's different than a lot of other literature. It feels like it's constantly challenging you all the time. And that can make it less enjoyable. I think there's some people who read this kind of experimental literature and they feel like it's attacking them half the time or overly um, abrasive in its challenge toward them. But I find that there's a lot of sentimental beauty that can be mixed in there. There's something uh, desperate and yearning about a lot of this writing. It feels as if it's using this experimentation out of frustration at the inability to communicate by the standards of the day and the ways in which those standards are almost an abuse of language for the sake of fitting the lowest common denominator of interests. And so a lot of these pieces are aiming higher, trying to be singular. And of course, they're going to miss in a wide variety of ways. But to read a collection where everyone is trying to really discover themselves in their literature can be an exciting collection indeed. Of course, another collection that I had to have is the Norton Anthology of Shakespeare. And I got the four volume edition, which I highly recommend. 
because you could get a one volume version of it or you can get it split into two and then that's just a really cumbersome type of book to hold. What's really nice about this four volume set is it's split among the different genres that Shakespeare had written. So we have histories, we have tragedies, we have comedies, we have romances and poems. And there is so much written about Shakespeare. There's so much analysis of Shakespeare available. And so what's super great about this particular anthology is all of that comes together into this such that there's really extensive, extensive notes throughout this book. And the introductions are amazing. They're spectacular. I had to read like 25 plus uh, Shakespeare plays throughout my time in university. And, you know, that was one way to go into it where you're thinking of, you're reading in terms of how can you discuss it in a seminar? How can you write about it in an essay? But being able to actually just sit here and read for myself Shakespeare, having the comfort of these nice matted covers and pages, it just flops so nicely. Just having all of the introductory apparatus around it, where they're going into the history of the day, they're going into all the references, all the copious amounts of jokes that are available. It makes reading Shakespeare feel like reading a modern piece where you have to puzzle your way through it. And also there is just constant golden shining beauty along the margins if you embrace it, if you just play with the sound. You know, the thing to always remember when it comes to reading Shakespeare is so much of the value of the writing is in the sound. It was not meant to just be text on a page. It's really, really great to have your own collection of Shakespeare. Tackle it yourself. Don't just read it like you did in school. Enjoy it. Try to find the joy, the, the constant blooming fun of it. Shakespeare was having a lot of fun when he was writing these plays. And so this is a great collection to just give yourself a chance to embrace it once more. Okay, just two more Norton anthologies that I wanted to talk about. I have a really battered, beaten up, this is actually the one I used in school. This is my copy of the Norton Anthology of Theory and Criticism. You can see it doesn't have anything on the front cover. I actually don't know if it had a slipcase around it or anything because when I bought it, this is exactly how it looked. I got it used. Um, the Norton Anthology of Theory and Criticism is interesting. It was a book I had to have for school because I was an English major, so I needed to read up on a lot of the analysis of what literature is. It's almost like in meta-ethics how it's a broad view of what ethics is. Um, theory and criticism is a broad view of what are we doing when we're criticizing these works? What are the methods that we should adopt? How are we looking at authorship and our role as critics? And um, what is the purpose of literature in many ways? It's a lot of these broad philosophical questions. And in that way, you're going to get a big mix of thinking on the matter. You're not going to get uh, anything scientific or substantive in quite that way. But I really think there is value in just getting a sense of what people have been saying about this very strange, wonderful thing called literature. When we sit down to write each other's stories or poetry and we're expressing ourselves in these seemingly deep ways and we're adopting the various tools of those who came before us, how can we read this more carefully? How can we attend to those details in a way that matters? And um, I think that this book is one that I recommend with a bit more of a caveat than the others. I do think, I think you should only get the Norton Anthology of Theory and Criticism if you really, really, really wanna understand a lot of the movements in uh, critical theory. Those movements certainly go off the rails in a lot of ways. So it's not going to be one of those things where you're just, um, I wouldn't recommend you just swallow it wholesale. I recommend that you kind of chew and bite on some of these ideas for a while and really make sure that it's what you want to swallow. Um, that said, one of my favorite classes was the one that required me to have this book. And it was my favorite because it was trying to take literature seriously in a way that is maybe too serious, but it's also nice to see the attempt. And as much as I didn't adopt all of the ways, the frameworks of how to view literature from this, I did appreciate having to contend with those ideas and maybe even challenge them myself. And so if you want to understand what are these wild and crazy English majors thinking, um, what are all of these 
uh, gestures that they keep making toward politics and ideas of how our identity should work, where did those gestures come from? A lot of it comes from literary theory. So if you want to understand what's going on in the world, some of the big, big, big movements that are happening in terms of any kind of identity category, such as race or gender and so on, uh, you should check this book out. A lot of the second half is going to cover um, some of the major, major essays that had a strong influence on the world. So that's the Norton Anthology of Theory and Criticism. And then the final one, this one I'm so glad to have on my shelf. I love the way it looks. I love the idea of it. Um, it's one of those things that I'm probably not going to completely read anytime soon, but I hope to dip in and out of for the rest of my life. It seems necessary to read something like this, whether you're religious or not. And this is the Norton Anthology of World Religions. Look at this slipcase. Look at how nice this looks. It's two thick, thick, thick volumes. Um, to be honest, it's hard to read them because of how thick they are. The pages are exceptionally thin on top of that level of thickness of the book itself because each volume is like 2,000 pages. But it contains everything you could want uh, from a collection of religious texts. It goes through multiple religious beliefs from throughout the world. We get Hinduism. We get... Taoism, we get Buddhism, we get um, Christianity and Islam and Judaism. And with each of these, we get the seminal texts, the key texts, but we also get so much of the thoughts about those texts, a lot of the exegesis uh, of what these texts are truly about. We get a ton of chronological history. And one of my favorite things about this book is how much introductory material there is. There's introductions about each of the main pieces of religious texts, but there's also historical introductions just explaining what was going on in that time of the world when these different texts were written. Um, and it's jumping through the history surrounding a lot of these world religions. It's not just, for instance, in the case of the Christianity book, it's not just the Bible. It's a lot of essays about the Bible. It's some of the speeches given by various popes. It's some of the political responses to Christianity, the ways that um, Christianity fueled and or resisted certain social movements throughout history. We get some of those texts. It's really just the surrounding each of the religious movements in and of themselves. And I'm not religious in the slightest. I can't seem to get myself to be spiritual or religious. Plenty of people have tried throughout my whole life, but I love reading religious texts. I love reading about religious texts because I know that it has significance whether I like it or not. And I just want to understand that significance. And this Norton Anthology is such a great resource for that kind of understanding. Again, it's not the kind of book that you're going to read front cover to back in one go. It's going to be one of those ones that you dive in and out of whenever you feel like it. And that's certainly how I've been reading it. But everything that I've read in it has been very satisfying for increasing my understanding of each of the many major world religions uh, currently around. So this is the Norton Anthology of World Religions. That's been my collection of Norton Anthologies. I have no idea who this video would appeal to. It's certainly a nerdy topic to have these anthologies and to want to read through them after you're done with school. But that's exactly the kinds of viewers I hope for. Um, I want to find as many like-minded dorks uh, like me that there are out there. So um, if you watch this video all the way through, you're kind of amazing. I really like you, whoever you are. I think you're exactly my kind of person. Um, so thank you. And if you have any collections of literature or philosophy or just essays generally that you think I don't know about, that based on my summation of each of these anthologies, that you think I would really enjoy, please let me know. Um, I want to know about as much other sources of knowledge as I can. Also, the editions that I got of these anthologies was so dependent on what I could find at a used bookstore. So it may not be the best possible editions. If there's something significant that you know about the difference in editions between the anthologies I have, let me know if there's something I'm missing that's very drastic that's, that, that's important, 
let me know. I know that with the Norton Anthology of World Literature and American Literature and English Literature, those change dramatically with each different edition. So let me know what I'm missing, if I'm missing something. Um, otherwise, just leave your comments below about uh, if you own any of these, if you remember going through the anthologies in school, if you sold yours and kind of regret it, uh, let me know what you think, and I'll see you around with another video sometime soon, hopefully. Bye-bye.